Yes, welcome to Home Studio Q&A for yet another week here on Studio Live today. This is our weekly show where I answer your questions about home recording, mobile recording, recording studio gear, connecting things up, you name it, we talk about it. This is live, being recorded live here on Facebook and YouTube, and we do this every week. If you want to find out the live schedule and you want to find out everything else about what I do across YouTube, across all the social platforms, head to studiolivetoday.com. That is your one-stop shop for everything Studio Live Today. Now, we've got a lot to get through here today. I have a heap of questions. I've got probably more than 15 questions. So we're going to cover the feature topic. At the start of each show, we cover a feature topic, and I'm going to make it quick here because I've had some questions this week about sharing your music. So what are the best ways to share your music? When should you share your music? How should you share your music? And the simple answer to this is, yes, you should share it. Uh, You should share it in a way that works for you, and that includes whatever platform you want to. Now, that's a very vague and generic answer, but let me break it down for you. So on the channel here, my my sort of mantra is create, record, release. And I say that before most of my videos because I think that part of the music process is you should be creating music, which is writing good songs and writing good performances. You should be recording your music to get a copy of it down so that you can actually have it, and then you should release. Now, by release, I really mean share. You don't have to release to Spotify, iTunes, Apple Music, or the rest if you don't want to, but you should be sharing it with someone because the beautiful part about sharing is it does a few things. It helps put an end on your song. So have you ever been creating a song and you get it to 99% or 93% or 86% and you just can't seem to get it finished? Well, until you actually finish it and release it and share it, you can spin your wheels. You can spend way too much time trying to eke out that last 1% and it's usually diminishing returns. It's usually as good as it's going to get and you would be better served finishing that song, moving on to the next song. The next part of that is related, which is that when you share that song, you are going to start getting feedback and feedback is essential to improving. Everyone has the ability to improve the way we make music. I'm not talking about putting it out there and then listening to the haters and the trolls and the whoever. I'm saying finding a community of people that you can share your music with that are going to give you considered feedback that are going to help you learn and grow and make the changes you need to make to take your good music and make it great music or your great music and make it epic music. So finding people and there's a bunch of different places. I recommend a few groups on Facebook, uh, my own. So there's a group called Create Record Release. Funnily enough, if you go to Facebook and search Create Record Release or check the description, there'll be a link down there. You can join that group. And that is a group of about 150 people in there. So it's a, it's, it's a nice size at the moment. Uh, and we're sort of growing slowly. But the good news is that we're sharing music and folks in there are going to provide feedback. Now, feedback is, yes, this is great. This part worked. But it's also, have you considered doing this, 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 and this. So you do need to make sure you're prepared for that if you're sharing your music. Let's flip over to the actual logistics of sharing your music. That is a little bit more complicated, but it doesn't really have to be. The number one place that I recommend folks share their music when they're starting out is soundcloud.com. Now, some people love it, some people hate it, but here's the thing. It is simple. All you need to do is upload a WAV file, an MP3 file, whatever, upload some album artwork, put some details in there, and then you've got a link. 100% free. You can uh, share up to, I think, 180 minutes for free and it's all good. The next best place is YouTube because YouTube has good quality audio. It has video. So you do have to create a video of your song, uh, but you can share that again for free. And then sort of third level is releasing using something like DistroKid. I did a video on DistroKid recently, which is a distributor. So what you do there is similar to SoundCloud. You upload your WAV file, you upload your album art, and then you release to all of the different streaming platforms. And that pushes it out to iTunes, to Spotify, to Apple Music, to Google Play, to Amazon, to Deezer, to a whole bunch of places. So that's sort of the three places that I recommend. You can, of course, share on Facebook. You can share to Reddit. There's a bunch of different ways. But let's break it down again. Why would you share? It puts an end on your song. It means that you're not going to continue trying to make things perfect because perfection does not exist. Number two, means you can share it with people, get feedback that's going to help you feed into your next song and make it even better. And number three, you can actually just get your music out there and it just feels pretty darn good to have your music released and to be able to say, yes, that was it. And you can look back now on your body of work. Like that shouldn't be understated or under estimated that it is really powerful to look back on what you've done in the past and then see where you are now and see the growth, see that journey that you've taken. 
I'm going to leave it there because we've got a heap to get through in this show and I want to start answering some questions. So let's jump in here. I'm going to throw the questions up here so that you can see them and I'll also read them out as well. Let's start with our first question from Pyramid State Music, also Imagine Six here on YouTube. I have basic chord progression, just some whole note chords to go on for four measures. How does one go about adding rhythm to this with the piano roll view so it sounds like a guitar if I were to use the guitar virtual instrument? So if this is specifically about GarageBand or really uh, any sort of uh, any sort of um, digital audio workstation, there's a few ways that you can approach this. And what we're talking about here is instead of it being like C... D, maybe you want to C, 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 D, 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 G, G, G. So maybe you wanted a rhythm in there. A couple of things you can do in GarageBand in particular, there is the autoplay feature, which is actually super cool. You can use something like that to bring it in. There's also MIDI loops. So regardless of which digital audio workstation you're in, if you look for MIDI files, they can actually have some rhythms and you can get some MIDI loops that you can import, throw on whatever virtual instrument you're using and you can get some cool rhythms that way as well. And then the other way is to use something like an arpeggiator. Arpeggiator is a really, really cool. GarageBand has a great one. Most digital audio workstations have them. And what you can do there is instead of having those whole note chords, you can make them quarter notes, eighth notes, sixteenth notes, and that's that sort of do 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 do. That almost sounds like a finger picking of a guitar. So that would be three tips to get you started. Uh, but of course, if you want more information or if you've, you've got other follow-up questions, then yeah, feel free to, to reach out. Uh, as I said, there's a few different places you can go. Head over to Facebook, Create, Record, Release. There's a great group there. You can ask questions about music creation or you can, of course, contact me uh, by all the methods over at studiolivetoday.com on all the different social platforms. Let's continue on here. Uh, this is from Steve Desper. Hello to you, Steve. Can you recommend a music group on Facebook to share my music? Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I think I just did. I, I forgot that I had these questions back to back, so I've already pumped and promoted my uh, my Facebook group. So Create, Record, Release is a good place. There are other songwriting groups and larger groups on Facebook that you can share. The problem with a lot of groups is that they've grown so large uh, that they tend to become places where people jump in and just post a link to their song as a, hey, my new song, it's fire. Please check it out. Like, comment, subscribe, be my Facebook friend, be my YouTube, whatever. Uh, that doesn't really help anyone. It definitely doesn't help the person trying to promote their music because they get tagged as spam and then they get their account closed. But it certainly doesn't help you as someone trying to get um, feedback around your music. So, yes, uh, feel free. Uh, I know the Studio Live Today community here, you're all good people and you want to help others as well as get help yourself. So create, record, release is my recommendation. If you're on GarageBand, obviously the GarageBand users group is great uh, on Facebook. If you're an iPad musician, iPad musician group is great on Facebook. And there are some great Reddit groups as well. So there's some iPad music group and there's a uh, garage band group on Reddit too. Plus insert name of DAW, whatever you're using, there will be a user group. And that's, that's a good place to start because people using the same software as you may not be creating the same music, but they've, they're going to have a passion and you're going to learn the technical at the same time as you're getting uh, feedback on your music, which is all the better. This one is from SM Borthwick over there in Scotland, who I know is on the stream here today. Uh, says, hi, Pete. Nice rundown. I'm curious about one thing. Given the vast array of plugins available for GarageBand and the limited number of slots available, do you find yourself having to omit plugins you would have liked to use because you're out of space? I tend to find, particularly on the amp sim, that I only, only having a single plugin slot can be limiting. Yes, it can. And this one's a bit GarageBand specific, but I know other platforms are similar. There's a couple of things I'll mention here. Number one is that when you are using the amp sim, yes, you get less plugin slots because I think the logic there is that you're going to use the amps uh, plugins and the amps pedals. Uh, which is going to give you a, a little bit of additional um, additional stuff. And you've also got things like delays and compressors on the amp as well. So you probably don't need as many. I tend to find I do. So a few things you can do. You can merge that track. And merging is kind of the key because you can merge the track and then put it onto a blank audio recorder track. And then you're going to have the whole six plugin slots to add plugins to your heart's content. Uh, you can also use something like the Crunk V2 Amp Sim, which is a free amplifier simulator that I did a review on in the last week, which is very cool. And that just adds to a single plugin slot on an audio track. Uh, or you can use something like Stark, which is the amp simulator from Clevgrind, which I really enjoy. So, yeah, there's no real workaround for that. 
and it's probably the one like, I love. I do actually really like the amp simulators that we have on GarageBand on iOS, uh, but it's the one thing that makes me not use them is that you can't then add a bunch of plugins if you wanted to add some track delay and some reverb and some other things. It makes it a bit trickier, but hopefully those few tips help you and anyone else who has that question. This one's about USB devices. Can you plug two MIDI or USB keyboards? Now, I haven't, I've yet to try this. I'm going to throw it out there to the Studio Live Today community. If you have tried this, let me know. I don't believe so. I'm pretty sure that most software, most hosts that I've tried when I've tried to connect more than one USB MIDI input device, they'll only accept one and it tends to either fail or only one will actually work. It's definitely the case with USB microphones. There are ways to use two USB microphones on Mac and on PC. On iOS, you simply can't. There's no way to, well, I never say can't. I have not determined a way that you can do it. You can aggregate devices and mix them together using software on your Mac or your PC. You can't do that on iOS. So I think the short answer to that would be no. Uh, I'm not super sure why you would want to, unless you had sort of two, like a keyboard player and a piano player, and you wanted to both jam and record your tracks together. But no, I, I don't think so. Someone can correct me on that, though, if there is a way, because sometimes there is a way, and I like to learn. Um, this one comes from Barry Tomkinson. What mouse and keyboard are you using? So I use a couple of different, and I, I wish I had them here. Actually, I do have them handy. This is handy. For those listening on the podcast uh, on audio version, I'm sorry, uh, you can look these up as we go along. But uh, I use the Logitech MK345 for a lot of my iPad work. So the keyboard looks a little bit like this. It's, it's uh, it's a very standard sort of keyboard, but it does the job and it comes with a very nice mouse with the nice mid midnight blue. So that's what I tend to use with my iPad because I can plug it in. It's one little USB unifying adapter and that's all. <coughs> Excuse me. When I'm on the go, I tend to use the Logitech K480, which is why I have it right here because I was on the go yesterday. This is a very cool Bluetooth keyboard. And my new mouse, I have actually done a review on in the last week, is the Logitech M590 because this mouse is a silent mouse. So when I click it, let's make sure I'm not clicking on anything that I shouldn't be. When I click it, it's so quiet. You can barely hear it not coming through at all so yeah i love the logitech gear clearly and uh, yeah the, the m590 silent mouse and uh shameless plug time but if you want to check out all of the gear i use you can go to studiolivetoday.com slash gear that is my gear guide it has my current setup so at the top there, it'll have Pete's current setup, February 2020, and I update that every month with any new gear I'm using, so you can know exactly what I'm using for my recording. And then it's also got categories, so I've got microphones, USB keyboards, uh, MIDI keyboards, like all the audio interfaces, all the different gear I use and recommend. That was a very simple question that I answered in a complex way, so I'm going to move on, or we're going to run way out of time. Uh, this one's from Anthony Sorongan. Um, this was in response to my guide to cables, so XLR, TRS, and high z cables. You said that cadence will need phantom power. There is only one phantom power in one audio interface. Is there any problem when I use two condenser mic in one audio interface, which only has one phantom power? Now, I wanted to answer this one because the what the, the situation here is, is that most audio interfaces, and again, I wish I had one handy to show you, only have one, in fact, I do, I only have one actual phantom power switch. And then once you actually switch that phantom power switch on, it provides phantom power to all of your different ports. So here, uh, where's this one? Here we have the Steinberg UR22C. And again, apologies to those watching on audio, but imagine that I'm showing you a switch here that you flick on and off. And that will just put phantom power to both or all of the different channels. So the two channels in the case of this uh, Steinberg UR22C uh, will actually have phantom power. Now, that if, you get, if you've got, say, one condenser mic and one dynamic mic and you're worried about that, it's not usually a problem. Dynamic mics are usually pretty solid and don't care if you're actually pushing phantom power through them, even though they don't use it. Ribbon mics do. So do not, under any circumstance, use a ribbon mic, but uh, with phantom power, because it will basically explode. Not quite in that extreme, but yes, it will not do it good things. So keep that in mind if you are uh, connecting things up, that yes, if you've got a device that just has phantom power and it looks like it's just next to one of the inputs, it's probably sending phantom power to all of your inputs at the same time. Moving right along. 
Uh, this one's from Jim Harvey uh, about my delay plugin. So there's a heap of great new free plugins from Nembrini Audio. They're available for free on iOS. There's also Mac and PC versions of these. Check them out. Just search Nembrini Audio. You'll find them. Uh, it says, can I use GarageBand effects in a live performance setting? I leave worship at church and looking for ways to fill the sound. Now, yes, you can. There's other apps like AUM and Audio Bus that can help you with sort of routing audio and using apps for, for audio. But yeah, basically anything that you can play that you can monitor out. And if you've got your headphone jack, either on your audio interface or directly from your iPad or your iPhone, then yes, you can use it as live. So you don't have to be recording. You can just be monitoring that. Now, GarageBand is probably not the perfect app for doing that. There's other apps that uh, folks use for live performance, depending what sort of things you want to do. But I definitely know heaps of people that literally just plug in their iPhone, they plug in a guitar with an iRig, and then that is their amp sim. And then they just send that out to the PA, and that's everything. And that way they can control their pedals, their plugins, their amps, everything virtually using their iPhone or their iPad, and then just send the audio input out. So definitely something that you can do there. Let's jump over here and say hello to the folks that are here live and see if we have any questions. Boom. All right. We'll come over here. Hello to other folks. SM Borthwick, who we answered uh, a question of before, says, I used two mics simultaneously on my last track, one condenser and one dynamic. That worked fine for vocals. Yeah, dynamic, especially like Shaw SM58, SM57, a good quality dynamic mic. Won't care if you're pushing, uh, if you're pushing power through it. It will be all fine. Uh, hello, to Jason Robert, who's here, says, good tip with the silent mouse. My condenser mic has picked up keystrokes and mouse clicks. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a problem that I have that when I'm, I'm listening to a live stream and someone's like, uh, so all you need to do is do this and then you just click over here. I like that sound just really irritates me. And again, it may be that I'm solving a problem that only I have, but yeah. Uh, who knows? A uh, question here from Daniel, Daniel Austin Fonica. Where can I learn the quick keys? So depending what you're talking about with the quick keys, keyboard shortcuts, there's a whole list of keyboard shortcuts for GarageBand. Uh, I have a video. If you search Pete John's keyboard shortcuts, it'll bring up a video. And in the description of that video is a link to a page that I put together, a PDF document that has all of the different keyboard shortcuts for GarageBand. The other cool thing you can do is if you hold down the command key in GarageBand in particular, but I think it works in other apps as well on iOS in particular, it will pop up. So hold down your command key, it'll pop up a link of common shortcut keys that you can use. So if that's what you're looking for there, my friend, then uh, hopefully that will help you out. All righty. Oh, I don't think we've got any other questions that are here live. If you do have questions then uh, and you're here live, please just throw a question and your question in the live chat. And if you're watching on the replay, don't worry. You can leave your questions as well. Just drop those down in the comments and I will round back. And a lot of those become the questions that I answer in the next week's show because we are here every week. And if you are getting value out of this show, if you're enjoying it, if you're getting some useful information, then hit the like button. That just tells me that I should keep getting up on Sunday morning and chatting to you folks and answering questions about home recording. Let's continue on here. We've got some more questions we're going to dive into. This one was in response to a video I did about the vocal transformer in GarageBand. And this is from Goth Boy J. Uh, what if there isn't a mixer icon next to the FX icon? <clears throat> um, so here's the thing in, in uh, I, I, won't, I won't demonstrate because again, the poor folks that are listening back on the podcast are not seeing any of that. So I'll explain instead. Here's how it breaks down. There are two different locations where the mixer icon may be in GarageBand, and it depends on the size of your device. So if you are using a larger iPhone, one of the Plus or the Max models, or an iPad, the mixer icon is going to be in the top left, and it's going to be right there next to the FX button. If you're using a smaller iPhone, especially something like an iPhone 6 or an iPhone 5S, then it's going to be in the top right. You need to tap on the settings, the little cogwheel settings, and then under that, there'll be not only the settings, there'll be the mixer icon there. And then you can jump in and make your changes. It was just a real, a screen real estate issue, uh, I'm assuming. So Apple had to move it across. So yeah, if you're ever going, where on earth is that, that mixer icon and you're using a smaller iPhone, check the top right instead of the top left. And in any of my tutorials where I say, go to the mixer icon in the top left, these days I try to remind you and say the top right on an iPhone. But if I don't, that's what you can interpret that as. But thank you for your question. 
Question here from Slinky Crown, very cool name, uh, uh, relating to audio interfaces. Hey, how's it going? I have a question. So I'm trying to record on my iPad. I have GarageBand, but I do not have an interface. I have a small Behringer mixer with six or eight ports, which has a USB output. Can I use this as an interface and connect the mics and guitars, etc., to the mixing board? Short answer is yes, you can, if it is class compliant. Now, most Behringer mixers are class compliant. Uh, the Samson mix pad that I used to use is class compliant. Class compliant basically means that it can work without having to have any drivers installed because unlike a Mac or a PC where you can install drivers, there's no way to install any drivers on your iPhone or iPad. So you need something that will run without driver in driverless mode or what's called CC mode, which stands for class compliant mode. So the Behringer, uh, the the popular series of Behringer mixes, the, what are they called? Like the Q, Q502s, 802s, 302s, they are generally class compliant. So what you can do is you can connect them up. You will need our good old friend. And yes, it wouldn't be an episode of Home Studio Q&A if I didn't lecture everyone on the handiness and the necessity of the genuine Apple Lightning to USB 3 adapter. So you will need one of these. You can try to use one of the cheaper ones. They generally don't work. So you've been warned. Uh, but yeah, if you head over to studiolivetoday.com slash gear, you'll find where you can check out one of these. So you'll need one of those. And then all you need to do is connect up your mixer, connect it up to your iPhone or iPad via your i. Uh, buy your Lightning to USB 3 adapter, and then you will be off to the races and you'll be able to record. Now, keep in mind that a eight channel mixer like that, like especially the Behringers, they will only actually output two channels of audio. What they'll do is they'll take everything you have plugged in, they'll mix that down into two channels, and then they'll just send two, a left and a right channel. Means you can record two channels if you're smart. If you pair one left and one right, you can record the left and the right separately. Put a guitar in your left channel, microphone in your right channel, you'll be golden. Or you can use all eight, mix it down to one stereo file, and then record just that stereo output file directly to your uh, GarageBand or any other digital audio workstation. So hopefully that helped you out. Question here from Alan Smith uh, around acoustic guitar recording in GarageBand. He says, I don't have any mics with my guitar sound and, and my guitar sounds muddy. Any tips? So anytime something is sounding muddy, it's usually due to the frequency response that you're getting. And the problem with the microphone, well, the, the microphone on your iPhone or iPad is actually surprisingly good. It's better than it deserves to be is the way I put it in that you can actually record. I've recorded backing vocals. I've recorded acoustic guitar sounds and I've actually used them in final tracks because they sound good enough. And once you add a little reverb, a little bit of compression and the key secret source to this is EQ. So what I use is the LRC. If you're on iOS, the LRC5 EQ is the best EQ that I've come across. And it is 100% free. It's a bit ridiculous. It's a parametric EQ, five band, complete Q control. And that's the important part is that if you use a visual EQ and garage band, you'll notice that you can't, you can control what frequency it's at and how far up and down, but you can't control how wide that is. And what you want to do with EQ is you often want to cut or boost a very narrow frequency range. So say you want to, say you've got some mud and it's around, I don't know, one kilohertz, two kilohertz, around that mid range, what you can do is grab your LRC5, make it really narrow, and then just cut a little bit down into there and you can find that frequency. And the best way to find a frequency is first, make it narrow, boost it, move it left and right until you find that frequency that's just creating the mud. It'll be that woom, 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 that little nosily sort of womp, womp, womp sound and just cut it. And then you can actually remove that frequency you don't like. The other thing is you tend to get a bit too much treble. So I tend to roll off the, the treble using sort of like a high pass, kind of, sorry, a low pass kind of filter to make sure that you're not getting that top end because, yeah, it just sounds a bit too trebly because the size of the diaphragm and the microphone is tiny. You can imagine how small that microphone is compared to something like a condenser or a dynamic microphone. So hopefully that helps you out. Uh, we get, we're, yeah, well, wow, we've gone pretty fast, but we've got a few more questions here to go. Uh, so a question here from Mark Bennett, and this was in relation to the FAC Maxima plugin and how you can use that to master a track on your iPhone or your iPad. Uh, Mark said, great. Can you use final touch afterwards for a further advantage? So the question here is, if you master a track, can you then send it to another mastering application 
and master it again or or refine it more? Short answer is yes, you can, but it may be diminishing levels of returns. And the thing to be careful with with mastering is you need what's called headroom. So you need to make sure that you are not pushing right up to zero dB. And the thing is, if you master in GarageBand or if you use a plugin in GarageBand and you master your track, you may find that you've already got like a bit of a sausage waveform. You've already got things pushing up because you might be using a limiter and it might be right up at zero dB. If you then try to throw it into Final Touch and master it again, it's going to start overloading. You're going to be over compressing, over limiting. And the challenge is it probably won't sound better. It'll more than likely sound worse. So keep that in mind. You can do it. So what, what a lot of folks do is they might use some plugins like FAC Maxima on their final mix, and then they'll send their final mix, making sure they've still got some headroom into Final Touch, and then they'll do their final mastering there. So you can do it, but yeah, just be, be careful with those couple of things as well. Question here from Rachel. Uh, and this is about USB flash drives using USB drives with iOS 13. Uh, Rachel says, just discovering your videos and love them. Thank you. Uh, not sure if you could answer this one, but I'm on an iPhone 6S Plus running iOS 13. And when I go into files and plug it in, it doesn't show. Nothing pops up. Any ideas what I'm missing? And what I responded to Rachel with and what I suggest is... I've got, I've got a video where I show the main reasons for the problems that you may have. Number one main reason is usually around the adapter. Uh, Rachel said she's already got the Lightning to USB 3, the genuine Apple adapter, so it's not that because a lot of your, and related to part two, is a lot of your USB drives, sadly, need power to work, which makes them less than ideal and less than useful, but I'll just, uh, I'll come back over here, uh, less than useful because you need to actually plug the, the Lightning port into power to actually make them work. I mean, you can use a portable battery for that, but it's still less than ideal. Uh, and then the third one is the format that the drive is in. So it does need to be in a FAT format, XFAT or FAT32, or one of the standard Mac uh, formats, HFS plus, whatever they are. Um, it can't be NTFS. So they're the main reasons. If you've done all those things and it's still not working, yeah, it may just be a drive that's not compatible. Like it, it is, it's not perfect. So uh, yeah, it, th there are some things that can, can happen and that you... So you may run into if you have those problems. All right, we are close to the end here, but we do have a couple of questions here from the folks who are here live. So I'm going to jump in and go into a little bit of overtime here and answer these couple of questions. And then we're going to finish off here. We have a question from Michael Howells. The question is, what is the best USB interface? What is the, <laughs> let's start that again and see if Pete can read this time. Question, what is the best USB interface? What is the best or cheapest USB interface? Uh, yeah, a really good question. And I have my own opinions and biases <laughs> when it comes to this, because for the longest time, I've been using Steinberg, Steinberg interfaces. I started out on the Steinberg, oh, clank the microphone, started out on the Steinberg UR12, and I'm now using this one, the Steinberg UR22C, which is a two-channel audio interface. The reason I love Steinberg is multifaceted. They are really solid. They're built like tanks. They have really good quality preamps. They've got the D pre's from Yamaha, really good quality clean preamps going in. They have iOS compatibility mode out of the box, which means that you can actually power these suckers from uh, a five volt DC. So you can plug them into the wall, you can plug them into a portable charger, and then you can connect them straight up to your iPhone or iPad using, of course, your Lightning to USB 3 adapter. So the U Steinberg UR12, UR22 Mark II, UR22C, UR44 if you want a four channel version, that is my go-to. Now, there are other options. If you're starting out and you want the cheapest, Behringer do actually make some good quality ones. There's the Behringer Euphoria UM2. That's pretty entry level and is only 16-bit audio. So you're not going to get the best quality results and it only has unbalanced outputs. So there's a few reasons that it's made of plastic. Uh, the Behringer HD series, I know a lot of folks use and really like. So that's a cheaper version, a cheaper alternative. And then the Focusrite Scarlet series. Focusrite Scarlet Solo, Scarlet 2i2, they get a lot of love and a lot of people use them so that's kind of the my general advice is that Steinberg is kind of my number one if you're looking for alternatives Behringer but keep in mind the cheapest Behringers are the cheapest for a reason and then uh, Focusrite you really can't go wrong with Focusrite really nice preamps really good quality but they don't have that direct uh, power you need a powered USB hub if you're using a, a Focusrite interface with an iPhone or an iPad but if you're using a Mac or a PC you're good to go and if you want 
want uh, if you want some more advice over at studiolivetoday.com slash gear under audio interfaces, there is a USB audio interface guide there, which has all the different specs of all the different uh, two channel interfaces. So you can actually compare each one and it has links to where you can go and purchase them as well. And those are affiliate links, meaning if you make a purchase, they break off a little chunk and send it to me. So thank you. For the question there, uh, we will. I've got another couple of questions here, and then we are going to have to finish because we are going overtime. So, question here from Darren Mitchell is: I have some multi-track songs on my keyboard sequencer, and I want to send it to GarageBand via MIDI cable into a Steinberg UR22, and then into GarageBand. Any tips to get me started on it? So, if you're sending a MIDI signal from a sequencer in this case, or a MIDI keyboard, then yes, you can use the MIDI inputs. If you've got an audio, I didn't even mention that in the last question, but if you have an audio interface like the Steinberg UI22C that has MIDI in, you can plug in via MIDI in, and then that will actually work straight into GarageBand. You can record those MIDI tracks as virtual instrument tracks into GarageBand. Now, keep in mind that if you're sending MIDI from a sequencer or a keyboard, it is not gonna send the sound of your sequencer or keyboard, it's just gonna send the the note Note data. So MIDI is just note data. It's information. It's how it's what note it is, how loud you hit it, information about sustain, aftertouch, all the rest. If you want to send the actual audio, what you'll need to do is get a line out and connect the line out into the line input of your audio interface. So you'd need to have on, on the UR22, you need to get a stereo out from your sequencer, stereo in into your uh, into your audio interface and record that way. So that is uh, that is my two cents on there. Uh, from uh, my buddy Case here, has a question, when releasing on streaming platforms, is it still necessary to use a limiter because Spotify also manages the dynamics? Really good question, and I'm glad you asked this one because it relates to the sharing we talked about at the start. It relates to the questions around mastering that Mark had in the previous question a, a few questions ago. Uh, short answer is yes, you should. Uh, you should actually still get your sound the best it can possibly be. Uh, they do manage the dynamics. And there's actually, there's a great site called loudnesspenalty.com because what happens is, People started making tracks loud and then other people started making tracks louder and then more producers started making tracks even louder. It's called the Loudness Wars. Go search Loudness Wars and look it up. It's quite fascinating. Uh, but what it's basically meant is that people were making their tracks so loud so that they would stand out on services like Spotify and iTunes and Apple Music that the services started turning people down. So there's what they what, what has now been coined a loudness penalty that you actually get, which is if you try and make your song too loud with limiting, they will actually turn you down. So it's actually going to have the inverse effect of what you are actually trying to do. So the, the thing with mastering and with limiting is to find that sweet spot where it is loud enough that it sounds good, stands good, stands alone, and if you don't touch it, it'll still be good versus making sure that it's not going to be so loud that it gets turned down. So what I would do is do your final mix, get your final wave file, upload it to loudnesspenalty.com, and then you'll be able to see there on Google Play, uh, I think it's Google Play, Spotify, and the Apple universe, iTunes slash Apple Music, and it will tell you how many dB you're going to be turned down if it's that level. So yeah, I still recommend make your final master the best it can be. Don't make it the sausage. Don't just push it all up so it's just a block of noise. You are going to get penalized for that keep some dynamic range but you do definitely want your peaks to be hitting zero db otherwise you're simply not going to compete with other tracks and yeah they may even turn some up if it's really low but you're going to be able to tell the difference if you don't have some decent limiting so thank you for the question very very good one uh, i'm going to answer one more because it's a quick one which is from uh salome Villani. do you recommend irig I do. I know people have mixed opinions on iRig. Some love them. Some really don't love them. I've only used the iRig, uh, I, I, iRig IO, the Pro IO, which uh, I've demoed here on the channel, and I really like it. Uh, if you're looking for a, port a simple, portable, high-quality solution for guitars and microphones, the iRig Pro IO is what I recommend. If you want to have a more flexible and adaptable setup, I recommend something like a Lightning to USB 3 adapter, a powered USB hub, and a Steinberg UR22C. That's my setup and what I use most of the time. But I also go back and use, it's behind me there if you're watching on the video, I use the iRig Pro IO when I want to take something on the road, when I want something portable, when I don't want to have to mess around with powered hubs with USB adapters, then iRig are actually really cool. So whenever someone comes to me and says, Pete, I'm getting into recording, what do I get? 
I basically say, what effort level do you want to go to? How much do you want to learn and know about how to connect things? If it's yes, I don't mind spending a bit of time and energy uh, to get a slightly better quality outcome and, and slightly more flexibility, go with an audio interface. Uh, no, I want something quick, simple and easy. Then it's go with the iRig instead. I hope that helps out. Radio. I'm going to have to finish off here because we are about 10 minutes over. And I know the folks on the podcast like a nice 30-minute podcast. So apologies, we've gone over time here today. But so many great questions, so many great contributions, and I really appreciate it. Uh, if you are here on the live show, thank you so much for being here and for asking questions and for joining in the conversation. If you are watching on the replay, if you're listening on the podcast, don't worry, we love you just as much. You can throw your comments if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, throw your comments down below. If you're listening on the podcast, head over to studiolivetoday.com. There you can join the mailing list. You can check out all of the different social media places where you can connect with me to ask questions and to join the different communities that we have here on Studio Live today. Thanks again for listening and watching and I'll see you next time.